Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. New year, and the question that was on my heart today is who are you following? Who are you following? And particularly, who are you following this year? Who is leading your life? Who's teaching you how to live, what to think and how to treat others and, and what to focus on? Now, many of us may resort to leading our own lives. If we're honest, there's been many times where we have done that. It's, it is actually a very difficult life to try to let Jesus lead you every day, every waking moment of your life. Can I get an amen? That is not easy to do. But is that the best thing to do? Yeah. Is that the better way to live? Yeah. Yes. But unfortunately, sometimes it is hard for us to... I have a nice little cheer section over here. Yeah. They're bringing some energy in here. We, and by the way, isn't it nice to be back in here? Yeah. Thank God. It's so good to be back in here. We do appreciate you understanding. I said back in December that if we ever felt a need to close down, we would do that for the sake of our church and our community. And I saw that need along with my team. In fact, my entire team was like on the same page. We didn't even have to debate it to take a break for a few weeks. And I'm glad we did because cases did spike in our community uh, in the beginning of this year. So, but it's good to be back and it's good to have a cheer section. Praise God. It's okay to get excited for God. I get really excited about his word. It brings me to life. So here's the thing. I want to encourage all of us to make sure that we know who we are following and, and be careful that we are not following ourselves or other, man, other men or other women. Okay? Why is that? Because, well, humans, we are short-sighted. We are flawed. And we're prone to make wrong choices, unfortunately. I also want us to remember that we are not our own as believers. We were bought with a price. We just celebrated communion. We just remembered that we were bought with a price and we actually belong to God. We are his possession, useful, and we are important to God. We are useful and important in his hands. And I personally don't want to make a mess of what God did when he cleaned up my life. I don't want to ruin all the work he did in my life by following some other way like myself and my own desires this year. The only way I got through 2019, 2020, years before was remembering to follow Jesus. And it's the same thing this year. I think a lot of us are looking for some new trendy way of living life, maybe some new book, maybe some new pattern. I know Cornelius talked about this uh, last week. Church, can I tell you something? There ain't anything new under the sun. There isn't any other new remedy to help us get out of the mess we are in, in our lives or in our world. We need to get back to what actually does work, and it's Jesus. It's Jesus. You can look for the brand new book. You can look for the brand new pastor to listen to this year. I don't recommend that because I'm your pastor, but you can do all that if you want. But the reality is, what works is Jesus. And for some reason, we're still trying to figure out another way. We're still trying to spend more time in different books and different articles and different people online. And the reality is Jesus is like, if you would just apply what I said, you will have life and have it to the fullest. So that's where I speak from today. And another thing I noticed in our Christian circles is a lot of times we'll look at Jesus as our Savior, but not as our Lord. Let me get out of hell free card. But after that, I don't really need to do anything, he says. I got what I needed to get. Now I can live however I want to live. And the Bible, if you read it, does not say that. In fact, in Romans 10, it says he is our Lord and Savior. So we have to make a decision to die to ourselves, to deny following ourselves, and instead follow Jesus as our Lord. And what that means is as master, teacher, and leader of our lives. So who, again, let me ask the question, 
Who's going to lead your life this year? Do you trust yourself? Do you trust another person to tell you how to live your life? And by the way, I pray that you don't just take my word for it today. As Pastor Coombe would famously say, check out my sermon today. Check out the word. Make sure I'm accurate. So let's get into why we need Jesus to lead us by going to his word instead of me and my article I'm writing right now as I speak and go to Luke chapter 9 because this is more important. Luke chapter 9 verse 51. I did not expect to get this scripture, but as I'm hanging out with God in that little cushy beanbag chair, he decided to give this to me. All right. And I just did not expect this one. Luke chapter 9 verse 51. We'll start there. As the time drew near for him, Jesus, to ascend to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. He sent messengers ahead to a Samaritan village to prepare for his arrival. But the people of the village did not welcome Jesus because he was on his way to Jerusalem. When James and John saw this, they said to Jesus, Lord, should we call down fire from heaven to burn them up? But Jesus turned and rebuked them. So they went on to another village. Now, another, so here's something that you need to understand is old manuscripts don't have the next verses we're about to read. New manuscripts are, I'm sorry, newer manuscripts did have these verses in them, but they omitted them. They took these verses out because uh, consistently old manuscripts, original manuscripts that we have found of the word of God did not have these last two verses worded this way. So they take them out of most Bibles nowadays for the accuracy of scripture and to make sure that they don't give a, a reason for critics to, you know, attack the Bible. So check out these last two verses. I think that the spirit of them is still accurate to what we see in other places in Scripture. This is how other versions, like New King James Version, ends this Scripture. It says, but he turned and rebuked them and said, you do not know what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. Now, does that sound like Jesus to you? It does. So there's nothing necessarily wrong with that scripture, but it's been omitted for accuracy of scripture. If we continue to read other places in scripture, you would read that same mindset. So let me walk us through the scripture. Are we, are we good with walking back through verse by verse and learning this? Would that be okay? Yeah. Let's, let's do that. So the first verse is, as the time drew near for him to ascend to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. Um, Jerusalem is where Jesus will die. Luke would bring this up multiple times, that Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. It was a veiled way. It was a way of saying uh, that he is on his way to his death, to fulfill his mission on earth to save mankind. So it makes sense that, that the New King James Version would have that verse in there. Now, verses 52 through 53 say, he sent messengers ahead of him to Samaritan village to prepare for his arrival. But the people of the Samaritan village did not welcome Jesus because he was on his way to Jerusalem. This reminds me of when God sent John the Baptist before Jesus, right? to prepare the way for Jesus to show up. So Jesus is sending people ahead to prepare the village to welcome his, his entourage, so to say, his, his crew and his squad. He's got his followers all around him. There's men and women with them. And uh, so he sends them ahead. Now, why? Maybe they were going to rest there. Jesus didn't live a hurried life. Did you know that? He took his time. He stopped and slowed down sometimes on his way to the cross. He slowed down to make sure he shared the gospel with as many people as he could. And he sends these messengers ahead and they are not welcomed at all. Now, why would that be? Well, I've preached a lot of times on the tension of the Jews and Samaritans. So I don't want to take too much time, but let me just give you one noteworthy observation here. It keeps saying the word Jerusalem, and that's because the Jews believed that the only place to truly worship God was in Jerusalem. The Samaritans, who were a mixed race of uh, Assyrians and Jews years ago, many years ago, 
they disagreed and they built their own place of worship on Mount Gerizim. So whenever the word got out that a Jew was passing through to go to celebrate Passover, to go into Jerusalem, and the, and the Samaritans realized that, they resented them. They were bitter about it. They didn't like them. They didn't like each other, period. You know, the Samaritans were actually trying to help the Jews rebuild the temple, and the Jews didn't let them. So there was a lot of tension going on here. That's why a lot of the stories in the Bible were uh, there's always a Samaritan-Jew conflict. But did you know this is the only time in the Gospels where Samaritans are spoken of negatively? The only time. And so he's rejected. The, uh, the people in his, in his group are rejected and it's most likely because they're on their way to Jerusalem to worship. Now, when James and John saw this in verse 54, they said to Jesus, Lord, should we call down fire from heaven to burn them up? This is the climax of the story, as we can see. And it escalated quickly, didn't it? Uh, you may remember that James and John are sons of Zebedee, also nicknamed what? Sons of Thunder. They must have a nickname for that, that, that nickname for a reason, right? They must bring some, uh, some ruckus to the crowd, to the group. And so their ways were a little bit more primitive. But at the same time, they might even be thinking of the time when Elijah had actually called down fire in two occasions to burn up villages, 1 uh, Kings 22, 2 Kings chapter 1. So it may not be completely out of the mind to call down fire and burn up an entire village for rejecting the one, this, the one Lord and Savior of the world. It almost seems uh, suitable to them. And, uh, but the thing that comes to my mind is John 3, 17. When I read this, I think of this. When Jesus said this, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him, right? Well, they, they, they must have forgotten that verse. And their idea was, let's go ahead and uh, burn the entire village up. Uh, aren't you glad that Jesus doesn't get easily offended? Aren't you glad that Jesus responds differently to rejection and opposition? I am. Because he could have decided not to take the cross, but he was obedient to his father and took the cross. They were hurling insults at him as he's on the cross. He forgives them as he's on the cross. That's a tough way to live. That's not easy. And that's the way Jesus is trying to show his his followers to live. If Jesus were so easily offended, we would all be dead right now. We would be in trouble. We would be doomed. But Jesus responded to our sin with mercy, forgiving us because we didn't realize what we were doing. These, these disciples didn't realize what they were saying. Their zeal for the Lord got a little ahead of them. And their zeal for God is notable and, and admirable, but it's misplaced, isn't it? Because Jesus does not like at all what they do. And this is what he does next. And by the way, just so you know, the Samaritans were wrong too. So let's not just pick on the disciples. Should you not help people in need as they're traveling? Yes, you should. So it's, it's wrong what the Samaritans did, but it's even more wrong for his followers. Isn't that interesting, by the way? Like the people, like Jesus' team still has flaws. And these are, this is a really obvious issue here. Um, we don't have perfect people in this church. It is obvious in our, in our world that there are not perfect Christians. Um, Jesus himself had some really tough characters to teach and raise. <laughs> And, uh, and you know what? Maybe that's some of us. We're, none of us are really um, perfect, are we? None of us are. We all got work to do on our lives. Thankfully, they were following Jesus, so they found out what they said and did was wrong. Can you imagine if you don't have someone to tell you you're wrong? 
what would you end up doing? Every time you were rejected, every time you faced opposition, what would you do? So Jesus turns and rebukes them. And then they went on to another village. Uh, To be rebuked by Jesus, that would be very tough. That would, be, that would be humiliating, in my opinion. He rebukes demons in other places in Scripture. He rebukes fevers. He rebukes storms, but he never rebuked a disciple until this moment. He responds strongly to James and John because he has instructed them to love. You ready for this? Love their enemies, pray for their enemies, and here's the one that hurts. Bless their enemies. You know, I can pray for my enemies and I can say, Lord, I pray you would change their heart so that we can get along. Well, that's kind of messed up. Or I can pray that God, I would, I mean, I want that to happen, but is that my selfish motive so that I'm right and they're wrong? Or we can pray this, God, I pray that you would help both of us to work out this situation. I pray, God, that we would humble ourselves together. I pray, God, that you would save this person if they're not saved. And I pray you would bless them richly and immensely. And may you change their entire family. May you bless everything in their life. May you give them favor upon their life. That's the kind of prayer that Jesus would want us to pray a blessing on our enemies. Wow. That would be hard to pray. But you know what happens when you pray that? Your heart towards that person changes. Your heart changes along with it. So he taught them how they need to act in these moments instead of react in these moments. And here's the thing, church. In due time, God would take care of that city. God would take care of that village. Jesus said it to them already before, and he says it in this next chapter as well, that If they reject you, dust the feet off your shoes and move on. Fire, not so much. Let's be careful with that part. Retaliation, not so much. Mercy, yes. And that mercy in that moment is to walk away and not say anything dumb or do anything dumb next. That's what that is. Is to act righteously and justly and mercifully so that perhaps they would know the gospel instead of being burned up alive. So what's the application to us? Because, you know, this is a pretty particular scripture. I don't think any of us are walking around going, hey, God, I call fire down on my neighbors. I pray you're not doing that, you know. (laughs) On my coworkers, on my family member, you know, I know we're not doing that. Well, first of all, I do want to say this. Um, one thing that always hits me is whenever we're reading about the disciples, we're reading about people on mission with Jesus. So I think a lot of times as Christians, we need to get on mission with Jesus before we get so offended so easily. Like they're, they're getting resisted for being evangelists and going out and, and sharing the gospel and traveling through and doing whatever Jesus says to do. That's why they're getting, you know, they're getting opposition. They're not getting opposition because they're jerks. They're getting opposition because they were doing what God said to do, what Jesus told them to do. That wasn't their fault that Jesus said, go ahead and prepare. You know, Jesus called them to do that, and they did what he said. So the first takeaway I want us to have from this scripture, the first lesson I think is important, is that we need to follow the spirit of God and not the spirit of man in this world. We need to follow the spirit of God, not the spirit of man. Who's going to lead you this year? Is it Jesus? Is Jesus going to be your teacher and leader so you respond to situations differently this year? Left to our own desires and passions, we curse and want the worst for people. We need Jesus to put our fleshly reactions and responses. We need need him to put them, uh, we need him to expose them. We, we, uh, We need him to show us those weak areas of our lives. Um, You know, our world, we reacted a lot this past year, didn't we? 
we reacted a little too much instead of slowing down and, and acting in the way Christ would want us to act. These are Jesus' disciples, the cream of the crop, right? Surely they shouldn't need this kind of instruction this late in the season. He's on his way to Jerusalem, which means this is the final year, maybe even the final months of his life. They should have been pretty mature by now. But guess what? Till the day we die, church, we need Jesus. It doesn't matter how many years I've known Jesus. I'm 37. I've been following Jesus since I was a kid, and I still find something ugly rising up in me. And thank God his word is in my life, whether it's in my, my daughter's room on a beanbag chair or whether it's in my car or in my office, I need his word to guide me. I need it because I know how I can be as a human and I need Jesus. So we need to follow the spirit of God, the way Jesus would want us to live, not the spirit of man. I think that we need to let this message, this scripture rebuke us and correct us and get us back on the right focus of why we are here on earth as we wait for what? Christ's return. And you know what? I would rather be rebuked by Jesus than praise for going with the ways of man. Amen. I would rather get a, a, a rebuke from my Lord and Savior than just do whatever the world wants me to do. You should be doing this. You should be doing that. You should be doing this. Guess what? It's unpopular to follow Jesus. It's unpopular to do what's right. You're not going to have a, 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 well, you guess you could have a little bit of a cheer squad, but you're not, <laughs> at the end of your line, guess who gets to praise your works? God. Angels. Great is thy faithfulness. Thank you for being a faithful, loyal servant. I'd rather have the one who created mankind applaud me on my way into his eternal life with him than me get some mere man to say, hey, good job for making that decision. You did the right thing. Did I? Or would Jesus rebuke me right now? Did I, do the, did I say the right thing? Did I post the right thing? Did I treat my neighbor the right way? Did I? Because I don't know if man's a very good measurement for that. And, and so my life, I'm... I'm lining it up to Jesus and I'm saying as a church, we need to do this this year because we've been swayed way too much in our world. I'm talking about the, the American church, the global church. I'm not just talking about our church. I'm not picking on Calvary. I'm not even picking on any individuals. I'm just saying as the church of Jesus Christ around the world, we need to make sure we're following Jesus this year and not the spirit of man. Number two, follow the mercy of God, not the offense of man. Look, God will deliver justice in his time. God will take care of that village. God will take care of our enemies. You can be assured of that. Right now, what he's wanting them to learn, what we need to learn is our focus is on making sure we make an opportunity for those who are hungry for God to hear us and not to also be offended by our actions and our words to not be turned off to the gospel, but be turned on to the gospel. We're supposed to make the gospel attractive. And so I'm gonna show mercy instead of letting the offense of man dictate and drive what I'm supposed to do. Tomorrow we're going to remember a remarkable man, Martin Luther King Jr., who did a lot to make sure that we are thinking about everyone in our world. And he was a pastor too, and he was a man of God. And I, I'm telling you, when I read this line from him, it, it, captures, it captures what the scripture is saying. It captures what the Bible says. It says this, we must learn to live together as brothers or perish together as fools. You think he was reading the Bible? I think he was reading the Bible. I think he had, some, I think he had fellowship with God and he caught the heart of Jesus Christ and he says I want to live together with brothers and sisters I don't want to perish together as fools and we as a church need to lead the way on that Jesus said it first love your neighbor pray for your enemy don't curse them bless them Jesus said that first obviously someone was following Jesus and that was Martin Luther King Jr. 
Was he perfect? No man is. And me and, and this church and other pastors, we're rising up and we're saying, we're gonna follow Jesus and Jesus alone. We can't follow the offense of man because the Bible says in Zechariah 4, 6, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. We're not gonna force people to change. The only way people will change is by the spirit of God. That wasn't gonna change anyone, burning fire coming down on them. That was going to destroy them. The world will not change by force, but it will change by the truth of Jesus delivered in the spirit of love. Delivered in the spirit of Jesus. So dust off our hands, dust off our feet, and go find those who will welcome you. But here's the thing, we're looking at helping people follow Jesus, right? That's what we're advocating. When we share our messages online and we talk to people and coworkers, we're spreading the good news of Jesus. That's what we're trying to get followers for. Come join us as we follow Jesus. That's the goal, church. The disciples were not thinking about the salvation of the Samaritans, were they? And Jesus wants us to think about the salvation of our enemies, our neighbors, our friends, and more, more than anything else. He wants us to focus on that. And last point, follow the mission of God, not the ambition of man. There's a lot of, there's a lot of things that we could spend our time and energy and money and efforts on. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of people telling us what we need to be doing with our lives, isn't there? But the author of life has a different plan. I think I'd rather hear from the author of life than hear from people created by the author. And when God, we, we see in scripture over and over again, God's focus is missio dei, the mission of God. To save mankind from sin to rescue us from the effects that sin has had on our lives. That's, that's the ambition of God. But what's the ambition of man? It's too often self-seeking. It's too often easily offended and reacting and not remembering the mission. I want to be, I'm learning from the disciples because I know I'm not perfect and I'm not going to throw them under the bus in this scripture, but they're a good example here that are we seeing why Jesus is going through Samaria? Did they miss it? Did the disciples miss why he's even going through Samaria in the first place? I mean, everywhere he went, what did he do? He preached the gospel. Well, that village didn't accept it. The reality in this story is there are going to be people, be people who do not accept Jesus Christ. There are going to be people that will not accept your message of Jesus Christ, the gospel. But at least, at least if we try, that is the most important thing. And, and let's not even talk about necessarily spreading the gospel. If someone offends you, remember that we are representing the kingdom. If someone hurts you, if, someone, if something bothers you, if this world and where it's going is, is, is causing you to, to be so offended that you know, we're forgetting to represent Christ properly, just be careful. Let's be careful about that. We can't take our eyes off the mission and why we're here. This is, this, I wrote this, I'm gonna say this word for word. He wants us to save the world from something we'll never be able to escape, eternal death in hell. And we get one chance, one lifetime to save the world before there are no more chances. That's the mission. That's the mission for us as a church here on earth to spend our time helping those people who would welcome you and welcome the message of Christ. That is our mission here on earth. I don't care what's going on in the world. That is our mission as the church. And it's also our job to figure out how to do it. 
and to learn every week how to do it. That's the mission. That's where we should spend our time. And by the way, um, Jesus' way of doing things was not cowardly. It was courageous. It takes courage to have self-control and not destroy a whole village. It takes strength to do it the right way than the easy way. You know what the easy way is? The easy way is to be a jerk back to a jerk. Am I right? That's easy. Hey, I can do that because my flesh, that's, natural, that's my natural response. Let me be a jerk right back to you. Now, see, the courageous, right, strong way is to not be distracted by the rejectors and the opposition or to react to them in a negative way, but to dust off our feet to dust off what happened, to dust off the things that offended us, and to focus and stay focused on the mission because someone out there is looking for Jesus and we can help them find him. <laughs> Praise God. So I don't care how many bad things happened in the past year. Our focus needs to be on following Jesus and doing whatever he says to do whatever he says to do. So let me summarize today's message. It's a critical reminder that we need Jesus to lead us. It matters how we treat our enemies and it matters how we represent God to our neighbors, our coworkers, and our world. It mattered to Jesus to rebuke them in that moment. It matters today that we are corrected and back on the right path People are dying and going to hell. People are going to be passing away this week without Jesus. That's my concern of what I should post about. That's, that's what I should get upset about. I should be bothered by that. I should be bothered that people are going to hell without Jesus. I should be bothered that eternal life is forever and some people are going to live it away from God forever. That should bother me right now. That's what bothered Jesus. What's bothering you? What's bothering you? Is it what bothers Jesus? That's a tough question. Wow, that came out of nowhere. I'm letting that one sink in for my own life. <laughs> God's mission on earth is still his focus, and we, the church, need to remember and keep it that way. Amen? Wow. It's good to be back. I had to bring a heavy message because I'm saying what God gave me to say. If there's a problem with it, you got to take it up with God, I guess. <laughs> yeah. No. Hey. Hey, it's the word of God. And we're not perfect, and we need work. Amen? So God's got this. He's going to take care of us. He's going to work out all the details. We just need to do what he says to do. Just follow him. Amen? So follow him this year. And uh, looking forward to coming back next week and, and pouring into us again. I'm going to pray, and then Dorothy will come up to share some exciting things going on coming up here. God, thank you for the reminder today. It cuts to my heart. It cuts to our hearts. Lord, we want to be just like Jesus, not like man. We want to show the mercy of Jesus, not be offended. We want to be on mission, not be mistaken and off. So God, help us as a church. Thank you, Lord, for your word. And thank you, God, that you used James and John. Even after that, they did amazing things for your kingdom. Lesson learned, move forward. We learned a lot of lessons this past year. We move forward but we move forward following you. In Jesus' name, amen.